Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh Caterer. I am the pastor of worship here at Village Bible Church, which means actually technically my title is Pastor of Worship Environments, but that's too many syllables for me, so I just kind of trim it down. Pastor of Worship works for everyday use, but uh, it, that means a couple of things. One, it means that uh, I'm not usually led in worship. Uh, so it was really just a, a sort of a refreshing treat for me to just be out there and just worship and be led by our wonderful gifted team. I'm grateful to them for serving. I'm grateful. Yeah. We are so blessed with a, with a talented, gifted, committed worship team here. And um, <clears throat> being the, the worship pastor, it also means that I'm not usually here doing this. I'm usually over there with the guitar on. And like the guitar is kind of this, uh, it's like a protective shield between me and you. So, uh, you know, I'm used to having that. So uh, for, I'm going to try to resist the urge to just like hold on to the podium for dear life out of self-defense. You know, hopefully every once in a while I'll step over here and kind of, no, I don't like that. I'm going to stay around. Um, I've been so blessed and, and uh, challenged and encouraged, <clears throat> excuse me, by the, the sermon series that we've been going through, Relentless Joy, through the book of Philippians. And um, Pastor Tim told me that I didn't have to uh, preach from Philippians. I, you know, I could do a one-off message that wasn't necessarily part of the series. And I said, well, I'd love to still have my message be part of the series because I, I want to continue to explore that idea of joy, but maybe we could uh, look at it from a, a different angle, from a different part of Scripture, because the first thing that kind of popped to my mind <clears throat> was this verse that I love, I've always loved, from Psalm 16 that says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. So uh, let me talk about joy, but let's do it from Psalm 16, but you know, I haven't been at the church that long, I've been here like eight months. So I don't know what's been preached. And I asked Tim, have you already preached on Psalm 16? He said, yeah, actually, sorry, I have. And I was like, oh, well, how long ago? He said it was 2011. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, let's see, it's 2020 now. Could carry the one that's nine years. We might be okay. I don't know. Does anybody actually remember the message that Tim preached, one hand, and it's Tim Badal. Yeah. Yeah, so, so obviously that's a very impactful message. <laughs> he's, he's leaving, hanging his head in shame. No, I think that... Uh, you know, it's been nine years. I think, we can, I, I think we can revisit it. I think we're safe to cover that ground again. And uh, anyway, I'm not going to say the exact same stuff that Tim said. Hopefully the Lord has laid a fresh message upon my heart. And if not, anyway, it'll be a good reminder. It's God's Word. So let's dig into it. Um, I'm going to read through the whole psalm. It's not that long. It's just 11 verses. So we'll read the whole thing. Um, let's turn to Psalm 16. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page 453 in your pew Bible. And uh, as soon as you have that, let's start just with a quick word of prayer, if you'll bow your heads with me. God, thank you for your word. We know that your word is living and active. And we invite that activity in our lives today. We pray that you will speak to us through your word this morning. Help me to communicate clearly, but help all of us to receive from your word today. Illuminate our understanding, soften our hearts, make us receptive to what you have for us today in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's look at Psalm 16. 
Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Amen. There it is at the end in that last verse there. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy is such a, it's like an arresting term. Right? You hear that and right away you're like, What's that all about? Because joy is something that we all want. All people, Christian, non-Christian, no matter who you are, you're searching for some kind of joy, and there are a million ways that people try to get there and a million choices people make and a million things that people go after that you think uh, are going to give you joy. But the farther you go in life, you discover that these things that you thought were going to bring you joy if you're able to attain them, they are often disappointing, right? uh, Pleasures are fleeting, happiness fades, satisfaction somehow isn't as satisfying as you thought it was going to be. Things are not all they're cracked cracked up to be, and uh, you know, such is life, right? Get used to it. But the Bible speaks of a different kind of joy. A joy that is not disappointing, a joy that is deeper, more satisfying, and more lasting than any of these kind of facsimiles of joy that we've been chasing and that we often settle for in life. It speaks of fullness of joy in the presence of God. And as we go through this psalm, we're going to see what that means. There's something about uh, the, the structure of the psalm even that helps us to understand it. If you go back up to uh, verse 1, as a matter of fact, even above verse 1, in my Bible, I don't know if it's, it's in all of them, but this little, this little line that says, a miktam of David. So we learn a couple of things from that. One, it's written by the Old Testament King David. But what about that word miktam? I I looked that up in some commentaries and they have a little difficulty figuring out how to translate that exactly into an English word. But the best that they can come up with is to cover or to cover up, which seems weird. Like, what would that possibly have to do with this psalm? But here's kind of the theory on it. There's a small handful of psalms that have this word miktam attached to them. And all of those psalms are, the the, the point of view of the psalm is written from someone who is facing some kind of peril. And King David was uh, often in battle situations where he uh, he was in the trenches, on the front lines of battle. His life was in danger. And the idea here is that a miktam would be a, a, a psalm specifically for those situations because it's a psalm that you would say with your mouth covered secretly so that your enemy doesn't hear you. It's sort of a private psalm. It's between you and the Lord. It's like a battlefront cry for help. And you can see that even in the way that it starts, the tone of it. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. 
The question, though, is if that's the situation, if that's where the psalm starts, preserve me, O oh God. Like my life is on the line. I need you to keep me alive. How does he get from there at the beginning of the psalm to at the end of the psalm? It's so triumphant. There's such this uh, declaration of, of, of rejoicing. Like verse 9, therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, and my flesh also dwells secure. So it starts in this place of insecurity, winds up with this place of being secure and joyful in the presence of God. How does it get from point A to point B? And uh, that's what we're going to unpack today. He found that present, that, uh, that joy and that security in the presence of God. But what does that look like? We're going to see that as we go through the psalm, and David is going to begin to uh, unpack for us what the presence of God meant to him. Psalm 16 is going to show us that we can experience fullness of joy when we practice the presence of God as David did. And so, well, first of all, right away you might say to yourself, like, why do you have to practice the presence of God? Like, aren't you just in the presence of God? I mean, God is spirit. We're believers in Christ. We, he's, he has given us His Holy Spirit. His Spirit is everywhere. He's omnipresent. His presence is just there. Well, yeah, <laughs> but there are different levels of being in someone's presence. And as an example, I will tell you about the time that I ate lunch with the entire cast of the show Full House. It's true. <laughs> the year was 1995. Uh, I had the opportunity to have kind of a, a, a private uh, special tour of the Warner Brothers lot through a connection that we had there through somebody at the uh, Warner Brothers records that we knew. And so my band got to go out there and um, be on the Warner Brothers studio lot. And you know, when it came time to eat lunch, it was like, oh, we actually have access to the, uh, the cafeteria that the Warner Brothers employees used to eat lunch. So we go to the cafeteria and we get our food and we're, we're sitting there, we're eating. And I look over and like two tables away is the cast of Full House. So you got John Stamos, you got Lori Laughlin, you got Bob Saget and the other guy. And <laughs> they're there, they're there eating. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I look down, I've got the sandwich. I take a bite of the sandwich. I'm chewing. I look over, they're chewing. It's like I'm in the room with the cast of Full House. We're all eating lunch. Therefore, I'm eating lunch with the cast of Full House, <laughs> right? And no one can say otherwise. <laughs> but to my point, there are different levels of being in someone's presence, <laughs> aren't there? And when the Bible talks about the presence of God, it's not talking about like in the same room, two tables away kind of presence. It's talking about being at the table with God. It's talking about interacting with God communicating with God. It's even talking about more than that. It's talking about having a relationship with God. The relationship that we see that David talks about and other figures in the Bible that Paul was talking about in the book of Philippians, this kind of relationship is a close, personal, intimate relationship. And we know that those sort of relationships uh, require a certain effort and intentionality on the people that are involved in them to make them work, to be on the same page as the person that you have that relationship with. And so that's the kind of thing that we're gonna see as we go through uh, the heart of Psalm 16. And we are specifically going to see and pull out of the text four aspects of what it means to practice the presence of God. What does that really mean? 
four aspects of what it means to practice the, uh, pr practice the presence of God. First one is this. Practicing the presence of God means loving God's people. We see it there in verse 3. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. In other words, saints is a general term that just means the people of God. It's not like in the specifically, sometimes we think of it, uh, it must mean like in Catholic terms, the people who have been canonized into sainthood. But what David is saying is that the saints in the land are the people of God in contrast to the people in the next verse. He, he talks about the sorrows of those who run after another God, small g God. This is the people that are running after the one true God, the people who belong to him. And for him in his time, that was the people of Israel. The people that, you know, the people of Israel had been called out from the surrounding nations to be a people set apart for God. And today, in our times, in New Testament, New Covenant times, the people that are called out from the nations are the people who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, guess what? You're a saint. That's kind of cool. And the way that we, that we could say this verse might be, as for the Christians in the land, they are the excellent ones. As for the believers in the land, as for my brothers and sisters in Christ, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. He's talking about having like a special special affection for and a special connection to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And why is that so essential? Because he front loads that. As soon as, you know, at the beginning he says, God, in you I take refuge. You are my Lord. You know, he has declared God to be his Lord. And as soon as he starts to unpack what that actually looks like, the first place his mind goes is, I love your people. I take delight in them. That's like the foundation for it. Why is that so essential? It might have something to do with who God is. He is a God of fellowship. There is perfect fellowship and community within the Godhead, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, eternally distinct but one in nature and essence. And right away you're like, oh man, he's talking about the Trinity. We're, gonna, we're wading into deep waters. He's going to be talking about the Trinity for like 40 minutes. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just mentioning it because it is an attribute of God that we have, if God is this picture of distinct persons being woven together in perfect harmony with each other, and we are created in God's image, then we are created for that kind of fellowship. God is not just one lone person who created people because he was lonely. God is fellowship, and he created us to display that kind of fellowship because that's who he is. And the kind of fellowship and community and connection that we were created for finds its fulfillment in the relationships that we have with other people in Christ. It's a God-centered connection, which is higher than any other sort of connection and community that we can have. It, it's been amazing to me, you know, since I became a Christian, which has now been, you know, it's been over 20 years, but it, it was, it's always been amazing to me the way that becoming a Christian has brought me into fellowship with people that I would not otherwise have been in fellowship with or hung out with. Which, don't take that wrong. I mean, it sounds like an insult or, you know, <laughs> no diss. But, like, let's be honest, our natural tendency is to gravitate towards people that are just like us and hang out in our little niche. And I did that before I became a Christian. I was a professional musician. And so all the people that I hung out with were people in bands. You know, and that's a certain type. 
you know? The, uh, or or uh, people that were connected to the artistic community, like I, I had friends who were actors, friends that were like journalists, and there's just people that were connected with the arts in some way. It's a type, you know, it's an eccentric type of person. <laughs> an artsy type of person. Uh, I've always gravitated towards that, but then I, I get into uh, the situation where now I'm, I'm, God has called me to himself, he has called me to become part of a church, found a church and started having fellowship now with people that seemingly were not like me at all. You know, for one thing, people that are older than me and younger than me, there's this multi-generational aspect to Christian fellowship because we're all one body, but we're also in fellowship with people that, are, uh, that look different than us, people of different nationalities, people of different skin colors, people of different walks of life, people of different interests, people who are not interested in the thing. You know, if you're, if you're in a community with other artists, it's all like, it's all what you're interested in, it's all what you like. It's like, do you like the same band that I do or, or whatever? But now, I have relationships with all different kinds of people, this much wider spectrum of people and the connection that we have is so much deeper, so much greater, because it's built on something transcendent rather than something trivial, like these shared interests, right? It's, it's built on something eternal, even. And the fact that there's a much broader variety of types of people that I'm in fellowship with, it, it, uh, it makes you know, that in itself makes my life a, a, a richer experience socially. But also the, the relationships are designed to kind of point each other toward joy because we're encouraging each other in our walk with the Lord. We're worshiping together, pointing, helping point all of our attention toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We're studying the Bible together, helping each other grow toward God, which is the, uh, the source of this fullness of joy that we're talking about. And so, it's actually very appropriate that th this was a day where we uh, recognized new members in the church because uh, that's reflective of exactly what I'm talking about. It's like a, a, a commitment to going deeper. Like, do you have that? Not necessarily, are you a member of the church? If you attend here regularly and you're not a member, you should consider it, not out of a sense of duty, but that there's something about um, nurturing that connectedness and that committedness to other Christians and growing in fellowship with each other that is a key ingredient to fullness of joy. David knew that. Loving God's people is an essential aspect of what it means to practice the presence of God. And it could be that if, if you're here this morning and you kind of feel stuck in your relationship with God and you don't feel necessarily as close to Him as you once did or you feel like you should, it could be that what you need to do is to focus on intentionally growing deeper in your relationships with other Christians in some way. Join a small group if you're not in one. Find a ministry to serve in alongside some other Christians. Develop you know, some sort of discipleship relationship with somebody, somewhere where, where you're allowing yourself to be accountable to another Christian and to lock arms with other Christians in a way that's gonna point you towards the source of joy. That's point one. Loving God's people is an aspect of what it means to practice the presence of God. Point two is practicing the presence of God means turning from sin. Turning from sin. Look at verse four. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. Now that thing about drink offerings of blood is like, uh, seems a little macabre. It's a specific 
reference to a ritualistic practice having to do with idol worship. And so, but just before you, you check out on this, because you say to yourself, well, I don't worship idols, and I've never poured out a drink offering of blood, so uh, I'm good on this one. Check. Not so fast. Not so fast. Because what he's talking about here is a principle that's larger than just specifically idol worship. He's talking about idolatry, but that means more than just specifically idol worship. There's, a, there's another verse of Scripture in Colossians. I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but I just want to put it up on the screen so you can see it. Colossians 3.5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Wait a minute. Covetousness is also idolatry. So idolatry is not just worshiping an idol. Idolatry is a bigger idea. Covetousness is one of the Ten Commandments, I shall not covet you, know, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's house or that which does not belong to you. But it's like an attitude of the heart and all that springs from it. Why is that idolatry? It's this wanting what doesn't belong with you. And it's idolatry because it's taking something else and putting it on the throne where God should be. Right? And there's a sense in which all sin is idolatry because it's looking to something else to fill you up in a way that only God can really fill you. And it's a looking to something else to give you something that maybe you're not trusting God to give you. All sin is idolatry. And David is saying here, I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. I notice that he doesn't say necessarily, I'm not going to have anything to do with that because I'm not interested in it. It doesn't appeal to me. It's not my cup of tea. He says, on the, on the contrary, I would think that the emphatic nature of him saying, uh, specifically, I will not pour out drink offerings of blood. I will not take the names of other gods on my lips. It's like, a, it's like this declaration. He, he felt like it was necessary to be intentional about declaring his refusal to participate in that. I'm not going to run after another god. Why? Because the sorrows of those who do that will multiply, who run after another god. He doesn't just say uh, the sorrows of those who worship another god. He says run after. There's like this sense of movement, like he's, you're running after another god. It's taking you in a direction which is away from God and away from the source of your joy, and you get the opposite of joy, which is sorrow. And he almost has this tone of a person who has some personal experience with that, right? <laughs> and we know, if you know about the life of David, he was not a perfect person. He was not immune to temptation. And he knew he had tasted the bitterness of running in a direction that took you away from God. And the farther away you get from your source of joy... the more your sorrows will multiply. Because there are things, and if you, even though I'm not going to get into the life of David as a whole, but there are, you know, he was a, 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 a man who gave in to the temptation at times of seeing what was essentially instant gratification. And instant gratification, you know, sin is a liar and it promises you a type of fulfillment uh, that it doesn't really deliver on because instant gratification, it's a, it's a hollow satisfaction that takes you away from the greater joy. You're sacrificing a greater joy for a smaller joy, which is really no joy at all. I'm reminded of this study that I heard about 
that they did with, with kids years ago to try to explore instant gratification versus delayed gratification and willpower and the psychology of it and all those things. And what they did is they would take kids that were like between five and eight years old and they would bring them to uh, this institute and you take them into a room and you get a kid there and there's nothing in the room but, uh, but a table. And so you say to the kid, okay, do you like pretzels? Yes, yes, I like pretzels. Okay, well, what do you like better? Pretzels or chocolate chip cookies? Oh, chocolate chip cookies, definitely. Would you like me to bring you a chocolate chip cookie? Yes, I want a chocolate chip cookie, definitely. So you say, okay, I will. Here's what I'm going to do. I have a pretzel here. I'm going to put the pretzel on the table. I'm going to leave the room. I'm going to go get you a delicious, freshly baked chocolate chip cookie on a plate. I'll even bring a glass of milk. I'm going to be gone for exactly 10 minutes. You will be alone in this room. See you later. When I come back, if that pretzel is still there, I'll give you the cookie and the milk. If you choose to eat that pretzel before I get back, no cookie. I'm going to eat the cookie. See ya. You leave, and in most cases, as you might imagine, the pretzel lasts about a minute and a half. Because there's nothing else to do in the room. This kid is just alone with their own desires. And they see a pretzel. You know, pretzels are decent. A nice, nice uh, salt on top. You know, I mean, so there's no mustard in this case, so it's just the pretzel. But still, it's something. And after a couple of minutes, you're like, boy, you start thinking, well, that pretzel really wouldn't be half bad. So the kid eats the pretzel. And then, like eight minutes later, when the guy comes back in with the, with the nice warm cookie and glass of milk, this is when the sorrows of the child really begin to multiply. <laughs> because he has to deal with the fact that he has chosen the lesser at the, at the expense of the greater. And that's what sin is. I mean, look up, what are we, our takeaway here is not just supposed to be that pretzels are evil. <laughs> but our takeaway here is that we are that kid. <laughs> you know, as we get older, you know, we, some of us have better willpower than others, but none of us really do much better than that kid. We're always, we have this fallen human innate tendency to go for the lesser instant gratification at the expense of the greater joy. To go for the sin, the little sin that is right there. It's, uh, people are doing it all around you. Or maybe, you know, it's a secret. Maybe you got secret pretzels that you're eating that nobody knows about. But you, but you know about them because the effect is that it's robbing you of the greater joy of God's presence. It could be that if you are stuck in your relationship with God and you don't feel as close to Him as you should, there's some lingering sin, some little habit that has a foothold in your life that you need to bring before the Lord and repent of. And like David did, to say, I'm not going to run after that other God. I'm not going to put that thing on the throne in my life anymore. We need to be as resolved as David did to continually turn away from sin. It's not a one and done deal when you become a Christian. Like, I have repented of sin. I'm good, I'm in. This is an ongoing thing. We need to be as resolved as David was to continually turn away from sin as an essential and necessary part of practicing the presence of God on an ongoing basis. That's the second point. The third one is this. Practicing the presence of God means cultivating contentment. Look at verse uh, 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. 
The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. All the language in this little, you know, portion of the psalm has to do with inheritance, like the lines have fallen for me. What's with the falling lines? The lines are property lines uh, on an inheritance, a plot of land that you are receiving as an inheritance. And that chosen portion part of it is like a, a portion of an estate that has been divvied up and it has been given to you. So this is all inheritance kind of stuff. The idea being that this is, this is what I'm getting. Now with David, uh, it's, it's figurative language because he probably wasn't receiving an inheritance of land because he was the youngest of several sons. So he's like, in, uh, you know, on the, the horizontal, like he wasn't receiving an inheritance. I mean, he did okay for himself anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> what he was saying here is that I, I'm not even worried about that because God is my inheritance. The Lord himself is my chosen portion. He holds my lot. He is my lot in life. And he is more than enough for me. This is a beautiful inheritance. I'm very satisfied with it. That, that whole section there is just dripping with that sort of language, contentment with my circumstances. And you're like, well, that's sort of incredibly chipper for a guy who, you know, is in the trenches. You know, he started out in a place of preserve me, oh God, because there are people that are coming for my life. And now he's saying, I'm very content with my circumstances. And we're like, man, I could use some of that. Whatever, whatever he's got going on, I could use some of that because the fact is, I have a tendency to be discontent. My default setting is to be sort of complaining about stuff that's going on in my life. You know, whether sometimes I'm facing legitimately difficult things, tragedies, obstacles, but it doesn't even take that. You know, I complain about a lot of first world stuff too. You know, first world problems. And I think we kind of uh, uh, become comfortable with that in our lives because it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? It's just sort of a, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like this like massive sin <laughs> to be doing it. But the truth is that it is something that takes us in the opposite direction of joy because when we're complaining about our circumstances, what we're doing is we are questioning the sovereignty of God over our circumstances. We're failing to recognize that whatever difficult things are happening to us in our lives, these have been allowed by God who is causing all things to work together for our good. And there are parts of Scripture that tell us that, you know, trials in our lives serve a, a, a good eternal purpose. You know, God is shaping us and molding us and building us up through these things. But we don't tend to see it that way. We tend to see it like we've been, we've been wronged. We're being shortchanged. And in the process... We are, you know, questioning the very goodness of God. And the uh, important thing to know if you're looking for, like, what is the secret, what was David's secret uh, of contentment, finding contentment in these kind of circumstances, it connects to what we've been learning in the book of Philippians because it was the same secret that Paul had. Paul talks about actually, he uses that word even, Secret. I have learned the secret of being content in any circumstance, whether I have a lot, whether I have a little, whether I'm in prison right now. My secret is that I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. 
And Paul was a person who knew that God was calling him into a variety of different situations, and some of them he was going to have an abundance of resources at his disposal, and some of them he was going to be beaten half to death. And that in all of those situations, God was with him, strengthening him, causing things to work together for his good, and that ultimately God had called him to an eternal, beautiful inheritance that provided sort of the larger context for his entire life. Whatever happens to me here, whether I'm comfortable or uncomfortable, whether I'm struggling or things are going smoothly, this place is not my home. These circumstances are not permanent. My ultimate inheritance is beautiful, and that's what I'm living for. Now, we all know this to be true, but it's difficult to keep that frame of mind. We need, like David did, to commit ourselves to re-anchoring ourselves to the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God, the beauty of the inheritance that we have in Him. Because cultivating that attitude of contentment in our circumstances is a necessary part of being in the presence of God, acknowledging who God is over our circumstances. Amen? That's the third point. The fourth one is practicing the presence of God means pursuing God's ways. Look at verses 7 and 8. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Now he says that the Lord gives him counsel. How does the Lord do that? We know that the primary way that we receive counsel from God is through his word. The divinely inspired scriptures contained in the Bible. The authority of Scripture is one of the foundational, non negotiable pillars of the Christian faith, right? It goes all the way back to these uh, creeds and confessions that a lot of us might have learned when we were growing up. If you, you know, went to Sunday school or whatever, and they made you memorize like the, uh, the catechism. Westminster Catechism, right, with the Q&A. You know, what is, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's a famous one. But the next one, the next question, question two, what rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? The answer, the Word of God, which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. And question three is this. I won't read the whole list. This is the last question. Question three, what do the Scriptures principally teach? Answer, the Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty requires, what duty God requires of man. So basically, if I want to know God, if I want to know about Him, I get it from the Scriptures. And if I want to know how to live my life in a way that's pleasing to him, I get that from the Scriptures. And you might say, uh, well, that's fine, but I'm not all into the, the confessions and the catechisms and stuff like that. I mean, that's a little too liturgical for my tastes. That's fine. I'm not asking you to memorize the Westminster Catechism. But the Westminster Catechism and all those other creeds and everything are just a way of crystallizing this essential truth that David knew and experienced and lived out in his life. Because that was his opinion of the Scriptures. <laughs> those were his only rule for how to know God and uh, live in a way that was pleasing to God. And that's seen in the writings of David, particularly if you go over to... Uh, David also wrote Psalm 119. When's the last time you spent time in, in, in Psalm 119? If you know that psalm, that psalm, it's really long. It's like the longest psalm. It's like 176 verses. Thank you. 
You get the prize. It's a little gift card. We'll give it to you afterwards. Um, 176 verses, and it's just dripping with… It, it's like a long love letter to the Word of God. It's like this huge brochure about how excellent God's Word is. And throughout Psalm 19, he uses a lot of different terms to describe Scripture. He calls it God's law, the law of the Lord. He calls it God's precepts, His statutes, His rules, His commandments, His testimonies, His ways, and of course, His Word. And I'll quote just some various lines from Psalm 119. I won't make you turn there now, but um, that's your homework for today. I have to go home and read Psalm 119. Here's some of the stuff that it says. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, he says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's sort of a famous one. We know that one. In another place, he says, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. In another place, he says, give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. He says, your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. So in Psalm 16, when he says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, that's what he's talking about. He's like, God, your, your precepts, your rules, your commandments, your laws, your testimonies, these are my counselors. And I bless you for giving me that counsel because I need it. I want it. David was in a position of uh, leadership. He had to make decisions all the time about what to do. And he wanted to make sure he was doing the right thing. He wanted wisdom that, that was coming from God. He also wanted to make sure that his own life was pleasing to God because David was a man who knew his own sinful tendencies. And he knew that the only hope that he had was to cling to these precepts from God and meditate on them. And he took joy in that. He found delight in that. Personally, I find that a little convicting. Do you ever read through some of this stuff? you ever read through Psalm 119 and just feel like, oh, man, i got to spend more time in the Word? <laughs> you know? Like I keep, uh, I keep trying to read the Bible in a year, and I'm like I get halfway through Numbers, and it's just like, <laughs> you know. So I've read through the first three and a half books of the Bible like 14 times. <laughs> it's a January tradition. <laughs> you know, I, I tend to spend more time in the in the in the Jesus parts, the Gospels, the New Testament. Uh, because, you know, some of that Old Testament stuff, it's a challenging read for me, which makes it all the more convicting because that's all that David had. <laughs> you know, he was just like drinking in these parts of the Bible that to me it's, are, are like, feel more like a, like a chore. There are parts of the Bible that definitely feel life-giving. There are parts of them that require a little more work uh, to get through. We're probably more directly applicable um, to a man living in the time and situation that he was living in. But the principle there, anyway, is that all of God's Word is given to us as a rule for how we can know God and know what He expects of us. And it is an essential component of practicing the presence of God. And I think what we need to get out of this is that when David gives us this testimony, these testimonies of how beautiful God's Word is and how much it has meant to him, conviction is a good thing, but it is not intended to be a scolding finger wagging in our face saying you're a failure because, you've, because you, again, only made it through the first three and a half books before you gave up and and just hightailed it back to the Gospels instead or whatever. It's not intended to be a, a scolding finger that makes you feel like a failure 
and makes you give up. That's what the enemy wants, frankly. But what God wants for us, and I think what was the intention of David's heart when he would write, these are, these are like, he's giving a personal testimony of how beautiful and life-giving and soul-satisfying and joy-producing the Scriptures can be if we apply ourselves to interacting with them and being in them and reading them and trying to understand them. And that's why we, uh, that's why we come here every week to hear somebody talk about this book. And that's why we join a small group and encourage each other in our fellowship with each other to get more out of this book and to try to understand it. Because practicing the presence of God, that relationship, going all the way back to the beginning, the kind of relationship that God calls us into, a relationship is a two-way street, right? We talk to God in prayer, and God talks to us through His Word, and His Holy Spirit applies it to our hearts. That's the picture here. The Lord, uh, where am I? I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. It's this cool picture of like during the day, you know, when the sun was out, like he didn't have electric lights, you know. He did most of his reading when the sun was out. The Lord is counseling through his word. And then at night, he's laying there in the dark, drifting off to sleep. And the time that he has spent in God's word is like, it's still with him. He's thinking about it. And the Holy Spirit is just applying those things to his heart. Even at night, my heart instructs me. What a beautiful picture that is of, of the Word of God playing this essential role in our relationship with God and being a component of God's presence in our lives. Let's take this as, a, as an inspiration and encouragement to whatever that means, even if we're not on a Bible in a Year program. Like, let's commit ourselves to spending some kind of regular time in God's Word every day, not just on Sundays, not just at small group, and letting Him speak to us. And that will be something that points us again towards the source of real joy, fullness of joy. Fullness of joy is available to us in the presence of God. That's the good news. Not just in eternity, not just as a when we get their inheritance, but as a daily reality in our lives. Let's pursue it together by committing ourselves to growing in these things we've been talking about. Loving God's people, consistently turning away from sin, cultivating contentment in our circumstances, and pursuing God's ways through His Word. And may God help us to do that. Amen? Let's pray about that right now. Join me in prayer. Father God, thank you that your presence is available to us by your Spirit and through the fellowship of your people and through your holy inspired word. Thank you that you make contentment possible for us. Thank you that you make freedom from sin possible for us. And as we apply ourselves to growing in these areas, the best that we can, we ask you to supernaturally strengthen us. We ask you to do a work in us to help us grow in all of these areas that we might experience more fully your presence and thereby experience the fullness of joy that you have called us to and which is ours in Christ Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen? Amen.